Hello everyone, welcome to History Savvy. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at Oversimplified's History of World War II, Part 2. And as you can see, I'm wearing a subject-appropriate hat that I happen to pick up from a local thrift store. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. So what else is happening? Well, when I said Britain was all alone, that wasn't entirely true. Many Commonwealth nations and other allied colonies had joined the war in Britain's support. They would play a key role throughout the war, particularly... That's true. Um, <clears throat> it, it, remember, at this time, Britain still had an empire. It was still the British Empire. So Commonwealth countries, even though they were more or less independent, um, they were still heavily tied to Britain. So what Britain did, they were essentially going to be doing as well. Particularly in the African and Italian campaigns. On the Axis side, Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the defensive tripartite pact, bringing their military alliance even closer together. The so, so with the tripartite act and the alliance between Germany, Italy, and Japan, that wasn't a, an automatic thing. So the relationship between Germany and Japan throughout the 1930s was kind of a hot and cold relationship. Germany also had uh, ties to Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists. So Germany played each other, uh, they played off these two, these two parties, they played off China and Japan, and in the end they decided Japan was the stronger country, and so ended up making a treaty with them. And the Tripartite Act was, it was a defensive treaty that was designed to discourage other nations from attacking any of the, the Axis nations. Soviet Union's war against Finland should have been an easy victory, but it became a humiliating struggle, and their military ineptitude was put on full display. In the end, they did force the Finns to sue for peace. Then, they continued their honorable campaign of pushing around much smaller countries by annexing the Baltic states and part of northern Romania. France's colonies in Ecuador... So, uh, Germany had a relationship with Finland as well. Um, so, in the Winter War, German troops uh, also engaged in... Military advisement, Germany provided military uh, weapons to Finland. So it, the war was kind of a proxy war in a way between Germany and Russia. Equatorial Africa were like, heck no, we aren't going to join the Germans. And they all pledged their allegiance to free France, except for Gabon, which had to be taken by military force. The Allies also tried to capture the strategic port of Dakar, but that ended in failure. Mussolini had seen Hitler's successes, and he thought now it was Italy's time to shine. So he tried to take British Somaliland, and that went pretty well. Then he tried to take Egypt, and that went less well. Then he tried... So, it, let's back up a second to get the map. So we have Somaliland, which was a British possession. And this is an oil producing region. So Italy wanted this for the oil. That went pretty well. Then he tried to take. And they wanted this for control of the Suez Canal. So you can easily transport oil up through the strait here and into the Mediterranean and make it more easily accessible to the Axis powers. Egypt, and that went less well. Then he tried to take Greece, and that went really badly. Churchill began referring to Italy as Europe's soft underbelly. <laughs> so the idea, Churchill did say that, but the idea of Italy as Europe's soft underbelly really wasn't a reality due to the Alps. I mean, the Alps had been a, a huge military obstacle since the ancient days in, in, in Rome. So you could take the Italian peninsula, but it would be incredibly difficult to get across the Alps up into Central Europe. Um, I mean, you just have to look at the fighting between the Italians and the Austrians in the Alps during the First World War. It was brutal. Uh, neither side really gained any advantage in the Alps. So the Alps really were uh, a protector, so to speak, of Germany. So Italy was not really Europe's soft underbelly. He began favoring a military campaign from the south and started sending British troops to Greece. 
All of this had Hitler pretty concerned, and he moved to protect his southern flank. He had been getting friendly with Hungary and twisted their arm into signing the Tripartite Pact and joining the Axis powers. Romania was also eager to join for protection against the Soviet Union. The Tripartite Pact was designed to prevent any other countries from deciding to join the Allies. Specifically, Britain's old ally, the pesky United States of America. Right, when war first broke out, Tripartite American public Act was opinion was strongly Act. against joining in. In 1940, there was an election. The Republican candidate said, I will not send any young Americans to die in Europe. And sitting President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, I will also not send any young Americans to die in Europe. Unless I have to, then I might. And Roosevelt... Sort of reminiscent of the First World War. And up until this point, Americans were generally isolationist. You know, things that had been going on in Europe. Basically, the attitude was, Europe's always fighting about one thing or another. And we left Europe. You know, we're a nation of people who largely left Europe and we're going to manage our own affairs over here. But we'll also be happy to sell guns and and send loans to them in their battles, but we don't want to get involved any more than that. Roosevelt won. Churchill asked him to join the war. But Roosevelt said, no can do, Winston. But you know what? Here, have some weapons. America began supplying the Allies with food and munitions, but there was... And money, too. Um, the United States in both world wars made money on providing loans to allies. There's one problem. German U-boats were sinking thousands of Allied supply ships in the Atlantic, including American ones. If the Germans could sever Britain's supply line, the UK would starve. Throughout the war, the Allies had to come up with better technology to fight the U-boats. Improved radar, aircraft with longer range, Britain, better weaponry radar. and convoy tactics. At one point, a man even called a meeting and said, Pycrete, you take some wood, you take some ice, you put them together, you get Pycrete. And then he pulled out a gun and shot some wood and it shattered. And then he shot some Pycrete and the bullet ricocheted off it and hit someone else in the conference room. <laughs> So the way I heard that story, I mean, there's a number of different variations on it. One says that um, Lord Mountbatten was the one to fire the pistol um, into a block of ice and then into a block of piecrete that grazed an admiral in the room. Other sources say it wasn't Lord Mountbatten. But in any event, this is something that, that did happen. And uh, I guess I'll let it finish and then maybe talk about it a little bit more. And then they tried to make a Pycrete aircraft carrier, but that idea was scrapped because that's a really dumb idea. In okay. the end... Okay, so um, the aircraft carrier never really got out of the dock, so to speak. And it never left the, the drawing board. But uh, experiments into Pycrete and its possible applications have been carried on since World War II. Um, some maybe 12 years ago, I think... There was a Mythbusters episode where they tested Pycrete, and they built a boat, and uh, they they ultimately decided that it was plausible but ludicrous to build a boat out of Pycrete. Um, but Pycrete does uh, melt slower than just regular ice, thanks to thermal properties and the wood and things like that. So Pycrete, it's an interesting substance. It's plausible but not practical, unless you're in a really, really cold environment. Alan Turing and his team of codebreakers cracked Germany's Enigma code, and the U-boats gradually became less and less of a threat. Back in Africa... So Turing is an important part of the history of World War II and, and code-breaking and cryptography. Um, don't think that the Germans just used the Enigma machine to send codes. The Enigma machine, as I understand it, um, it was just more of a general encrypted code for general use amongst the German armed forces, and there was a different uh, cryptographic set that was used for communications between higher German officials, and Turing also worked on cracking that code as well. It's also said that uh, what was done at Bletchley Park with Alan Turing and the other code breakers sh shortened the war by two years, and honestly, I think that's really difficult to quantify as there's a lot of moving parts going on in the war. There's a lot of people in various managerial positions that are making decisions um, based on information they have, what they personally believe is possible in those situations. So to say that the war was shortened by two years by cracking the Enigma code, it's plausible, but I, I don't think that that's... Um, something to really bank on. It's it's difficult to quantify. Britain decided to push Italy out of Egypt. Hey, that was pretty easy. So they kept going. Hitler realized he was going to have to finally step in and do something. He went to Bulgaria and Yugoslavia and said, hey, I'm going to move troops through you to get to Greece. So either join us or, you know, 
be invaded. Bulgaria opted to join them. Yugoslavia opted to be invaded. Then Greece finally fell to the joint German-Italian invasion. The British had moved troops from North Africa to fight in Greece, which helped Rommel and his tank divisions push the British back to Egypt. And they could have kept going, but a small, mostly Australian force held out under siege for eight months in Tobruk, denying the Germans a strategic port city and disrupting their supply line. Despite which is a, a neat story in and of itself. It was a, a multinational force. I think there were some free Czech soldiers fighting in Torbrook as well. But a lot of them were from Australia and I think some from New Zealand. But during the war, there was a, a, an English language propaganda program that was put out by Germany. And the announcer was known to the Allies as Lord Ha Ha. And Lord Ha Ha said that the British soldiers trapped in... Torbrook were like rats in a trap. And so the Australians embraced that that name and called themselves the Rats of Torbrook. Despite having some success in the Middle East, the British didn't seem like any real threat for now. Hey, Soviet Union, look out! With three million troops, Hitler launched the largest ground invasion in history, and Stalin was far from ready. Both so, uh... Is I think there was 3 million troops on the German side and 5 million troops on the Soviet side. Churchill and Roosevelt had warned him of an impending attack, but he dug his head in the sand and the Soviets didn't... It wasn't just Allied intelligence that Stalin ignored. It was the intelligence of his own spy network and commissars. And so he really, he duffed it on that. Stand a chance. Germany made staggering progress with huge encircling movements capturing mind boggling numbers of Russian troops. A quarter million at Bialystok, Minsk, 300,000 at Smolensk, nearly 700,000 at Kiev, and again at Vyazma and Bransk. Leningrad was put under a siege that would last an insufferable four years. Right, so here you could see the, the continuation of the, uh, the continuation war where the Finns uh, broke their treaty with. The Soviet Union and launched an attack to reclaim lands that they'd ceded to the Soviet Union in 1940. Again, they were supported by the Germans more openly this time. In fact, the Germans used Finnish airfields to launch attacks into the Soviet territory. The invasion of Russia had been Hitler's main ideological goal from the beginning, and his hatred for the ethnic peoples there was now unleashed in all its fury. The Eastern Front of the Second World War was brutal for all that endured it. The Germans were well. I don't know that that's saying much. War is brutal for anybody who endures it anywhere in the world. Now inside of Moscow. And that's it. It's all over. But then it happened. It got cold. Stupid cold. Hitler had hoped the Soviets would give up before winter, but they kept fighting. His um, <clears throat> so let's talk about Operation Barbarossa for a second here. Hitler wanted to get it started pretty early in the year. But German operations in Greece uh, took forces and attention away from Barbarossa for five weeks. Five precious weeks that the Germans could have used to have success in the East. So they launched their attack later than Hitler originally wanted to. And Hitler's focus was on the uh, resource-rich regions of Ukraine and uh, close to the Black Sea, and those places. Hitler's generals wanted to take Moscow, and they came super, super close to taking Moscow. But because there was some pushback in other parts of the front, Hitler pulled troops from the Moscow push down south, and they didn't end up taking Moscow. It's, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a debate you could have as to what could have happened if the Germans took Moscow. Moscow wasn't really a resource-rich part of Russia, but it was a psychologically rich resource of Russia. So the capture of Moscow by the Germans would have had a huge psychological impact on the Soviet people. But Hitler wanted to, he was more practical in the sense that he wanted the, the resources, the oils and things like that, so he could have his army function more efficiently. Another problem with Operation Barbarossa was his panzers moved, uh, they pushed in far, far ahead of the foot soldiers, and then their supply trains were stretched really thin, so they had a difficult time getting supplies. And so Blitzkrieg kind of, it failed in this sense because of the space of Russia. Blitzkrieg relies on aircraft, tanks and foot soldiers moving very quickly together. In this case, the tanks moved ahead, the soldiers were a little bit behind, 
there was air superiority to be had, but just the amount of land they had to cover really absorbed the shock and awe effect and the effectiveness of Blitzkrieg in general. His commanders came to him and said, can we please dig in for the winter and wait until spring? No, keep going. But oil is literally freezing inside our vehicles. That's fine, keep going. We're having to leave the corpses of our frozen horses by the side of... So, in this part of the world, uh, you've got autumn rains that really turn the ground into just a mucky mess. And that slowed German, the German advancement and German movements down. And, and in October, sorry, in November, you've got the snows that come. And that's when um, shiz really starts to get real for the Germans. Out of the road so we can still find our way in the snowdrift. Perfectly normal. Keep going. Hitler hadn't given his millions of men winter clothing and supplies because he thought he really should have won by now. Again, but there was also huge problems with uh, running effective supply trains to the front because there's just so much land to be covered. Then, Stalin called in troops from the Siberian front, specially trained to fight in the extreme cold, and the Germans were no match. They were now being pushed back. They had no choice but to dig in and wait for winter to end. Germany's victories were staggering, and Japan was eager not to miss the victory. One last thing I want to mention on the uh, Operation Barbarossa is when I lived in Germany, <clears throat> I lived in a city called Ingolstadt, and I befriended an old man there. And uh, this this one day I found out that my friend was in, in the hospital. So I went to the hospital to visit him. And he was tired and quiet, so I just sat next to him um, just for some company. And he had his hands in his lap just kind of like this. And I noticed that this part of his hand was pretty much gone. There was just some skin. It looked like kind of a webbing between a, a duck's in a in a duck's feet and i asked him what happened because i knew he was a factory worker f for most of his life and he just simply turned to me and said i lost that in the war a russian bullet took that part of me and you know that was kind of surprising that's not the answer i was expecting and i just left it at that because uh, i learned that you didn't really talk about the war with um, the surviving combat veterans, as first of all, most of them didn't really want to talk about it, and it was it was just too hard. Um, I talked to one guy who uh, mentioned some of his memories of the war, and he didn't get very far before he just said, "I can't talk about this anymore. It's it's too hard." You know, talking about seeing the the number of bodies just mangled and stuff, it was it was too hard for him. So I just wanted to share that sort of interesting part of my life. Victory bus. Their war in China had come to a standstill, but they wanted to keep expanding their sphere of influence and getting those sweet, sweet raw materials. They began making plans to expand southward, but there was a problem. Southeast Asia was heavily colonized by America and Great Britain. It was also full of... So this would have been Spain had the uh, Spanish-American War not happened. ...of ocean. Ocean meant naval combat, and there was no way the Japanese Navy could stand up to the US and the UK. So they thought, I don't know that that's really true. Um, the Japanese had been making huge strides in military buildup, and because they're an island, I mean, really, they had the example of Britain before them, and Britain had always prided itself on its navy, and so they understood the value of having a large and effective navy. So to say that they couldn't stand up against the U.S. or Britain in this part of the world, I, I don't think that's technically true. Wouldn't it be nice if we could destroy their navies before we begin our conquest? I might be wrong. And so it was. Uh, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise air raid on the U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor and inflicted a huge amount of damage. They also attacked British colonies in Southeast Asia. Roosevelt had no choice but to declare war on Japan, and so did Churchill. Hitler then declared war on America, even though he totally didn't have to. <laughs> Well, the Tripartite Act says if uh, one nation in the pact is attacked, then the other nations declare war on the attacking nation. So in this case, Hitler pretty much had to declare war on the, the United States because Japan was, was an ally.
The attack on Pearl Harbor seemed like a big Japanese victory, but they didn't attack any of the naval repair yards, fuel storage tanks, or the submarine base, meaning the Pacific fleet would be up and running again pretty anyway. soon. In the meantime, though, the Japanese were able to begin their conquest. They took Guam, the Gilbert Islands, Wake Island, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. They forced Thailand to join them so they could march their troops through to Malaya. They swept through Singapore, North Borneo, the East Indies, New Guinea, the Solomons, and they were now threatening Northern Australia and the borders of India. Japan's victory had been a stag... See... And again, I think this supports my argument that uh, Japan's Navy could in fact stand up to the Americans and the British because here, apparently the British did nothing here according to their narrative here. So if the Brits had a large Navy here, they should have been able to really put up a fight with the Japanese in defending their overseas colonies, but apparently they didn't. Um, the loss of Singapore was interesting because they uh, the Japanese came overland through Thailand as it was pointed out here and the Brits were expecting the Japanese would come from the sea as the Germans, and it reinforced the Japanese idea that this was a divine war which they were destined to win but their victories had been based on speed not power and power would eventually catch up with them for now though in all occupied nations the people suffered persecution forced labor, harsh punishments for any who spoke out against their occupiers. In Europe, the Nazis were rounding up ethnic minorities and other unwanted groups and individuals. In particular, millions of Jewish people would suffer through the terrible events of the Holocaust. Brave resistance movements rose up right. in defiance of their invaders, while the people... And speaking of the Holocaust, if you ever get the chance to visit a concentration camp, um, I think it's worth the visit. I've been to Dachau in Bavaria, and that was one of the first concentration camps that served as a model concentration camp for later camps. Um, but I learned a lot there that I hadn't learned either from history books or lessons or, or anything like that. And to stand in these places where s if such unspeakable horror happened makes an impression on you that you can't get from any other source. Um, so if you want to understand what the concentration camps were about and get a small, small inkling of what it was like to be in these concentration camps as a prisoner, I, I would say Dachau is a great uh, opportunity to understand the Holocaust better. People held out for hope, and hope was coming. Winter was over, and Hitler could continue his push eastward, but this time he switched up his strategy. Core Power has 26 grams of high-quality protein to help you recover and build lean muscle. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon <coughs> University. Visit gcu.edu. He wanted to focus on the south. His plan was to cut off the Russian armies in the Caucasus, an area full of oil, and then invade right. the Caucasus and take all the oil. His forces moved across the north with ease, and Hitler got cocky. He rerouted the 4th Panzer Army south early, Oil leaving the 6th Army to complete huge, the encircling movement alone. Factor. To do so, the 6th Army had to reach and take the key Soviet city of Stalingrad. The Russians defended it fiercely. Is that a and pickle? <laughs> a hammer and pickle. That's, that's cute. Stalingrad saw some of the harshest fighting of the entire war. The Soviets held up the German advance for five months as they battled in the war-torn city, which bought them valuable time. When the Germans had first launched their invasion a year earlier, the Soviets had moved their factories to the east. Those factories had been building a butt-ton of tanks and aircraft and getting the Soviet army up to scratch. Now and the Soviets also benefited greatly from Allied shipments of grain from the United States. Um, the, the United States also pr produced a lot of planes that the Soviet Union relied upon um, the, I can't remember its P designation in the United States, but it was called the Aero Cobra. And it's, it's an interesting aircraft. You should look that up. Now it was ready. Stalin gathered his new and improved forces around the city. And in an attack that resembled Hitler's own encirclement tactics, they began surrounding the sixth army. Hitler's commanders came to him and said, Hey, maybe we should retreat. But Hitler said, no, no, you stay. Yep, and he fired the entire sixth army was trapped him. and had to surrender. With complete air superiority, the Soviets started pushing westward. For but also at this time, there were attacks coming from Africa, British and American air attacks coming from uh, Africa that flew up and would bomb the oil refineries in Romania. I think Palesti was a big one. I, I once, well, I knew a man 
who was a U.S. airman. He was a B-17 engineer and uh, talked about these bombing raids into Romania and how they were the most hated raids because they were just so absolutely dangerous. Uh, he later was shot down over Germany on a bombing mission and was captured and ended up surviving the war. For Stalin, it was a resounding victory. For Hitler, an absolute catastrophe. Things also weren't looking too good for Hitler elsewhere. With America now in the war, Allied bombing over German cities reached devastating levels. In Africa, the British had pushed Rommel back again, then they were pushed back again, and finally, after a decisive battle at El Alamein, and with American and British troops arriving in the West, the Germans and Italians were squeezed out of Africa. Japan was also already seeing its rapid success being turned around. They attempted to take the island of Midway, but the US Navy was ready for the attack, and they sank Japan's carrier. Actually, they sank a lot of them. It was a battle that from which the Japanese Navy huge, would never huge recover. Moment British, for the Indian, American and Chinese Navy troops held the line in the harsh jungle terrain of Burma, and the Japanese suffered losses in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. They began to realize they were not invincible. So, it doesn't mention it. Yeah, it doesn't mention it because we would have moved past it by this point. But in April 1942, there was the Doodle Little raid that uh, was launched against Japan, and it was a raid that used. B-25 Mitchell bombers launched from aircraft carriers that flew over Tokyo and other major Japanese cities, bombed them, and then flew on in, into China. The original plan was to land the bombers in Chinese airfields and then turn the bombers over to the Chinese for their own use. Well, because the, uh, the task force with the bombers was spotted by a Japanese fishing vessel, uh, Far ahead of where they were supposed to take off, they launched their attack early. They successfully bombed Japanese cities, but had to ditch over China or the sea. And uh, it's a really incredible story. There's a couple books that were written about it from members of the Doolittle Raiders. Uh, one of them is called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo by Lawson. I think he was captain of the ruptured duck. But I've also read uh, J James Doolittle's, Jimmy Doolittle's autobiography called I Can Never Be So Lucky Again in which he talks about that raid. In fact, after he'd bombed Tokyo, uh, they flew over China and they ditched and he parachuted into a rice field that was freshly fertilized with human feces. And at that point, he thought he had absolutely failed in the mission. He was the, the leader of the mission and he thought things had just gone terribly and that he was facing a course marshal when he got back, if he got back. He got back and was actually promoted. It was a huge success. It was a psychological win for the Americans, and it was a psychological uh, loss for the Japanese. I, I think, I might be wrong, but I think in one of the books, maybe it's 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, um, Lawson, the author, says that the Japanese radio broadcaster was saying, we are the kamikaze, we are the divine wind, uh, we can't be touched on our home islands. We are so secure. And then within an hour or so, um, the, the raid happened. The raiders were told not to bomb the Imperial Palace because they didn't want to anger the Japanese uh, and kind of solidify them and have the palace be a rallying point for the Japanese. They just wanted to damage military industry. So that's a, a great part of the history of World War II from from the American side, and I, I suggest you look more into it. 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, it's not a long read, but it is a good read. With the Axis out of Africa, the Allies had to decide their next move. Churchill still wanted to attack from the south, while the Americans preferred a full sea invasion in northern France. All right, said the Americans, we'll do it your way. Allied forces successfully landed in Sicily and began moving north. They also carried out bombing raids over Rome. The thing was, many of the people in Sicily had relatives living in America, and they greeted the American troops quite warmly. With the war reaching home territory, most Italians just weren't that into it, and Mussolini was suddenly very unpopular. I would be interested to know more uh, about family relations that were discovered during World War II. One of the men I met, the old men I met while I was living in Germany, he said he was captured in, in 1944 um, after the Allies invaded Normandy, and he was in France, and he, they were in for morning roll call. And there was an American sergeant coming down the line, 
uh, going through names and getting, I guess, some more personal information. But he walked up to the guy next to the guy I knew. And the American spoke German. And he asked this guy, is your name such and such? And the German responded, yes. Is your mother so and so? Yes. And then the American sergeant just slapped the German soldier. And everybody was shocked and come to find out they were cousins. So just an incredible coincidence uh, that happened. And, and clearly, if, if this is to be believed, and I have no reason to doubt it, there were multiple family connections that were discovered uh, in the course of the war between Americans and Europeans. He was voted out by his own fascist Grand Council and was toppled from power. Italy immediately began negotiations for surrender. And of course, Mussolini was brutally executed and his body was hung up by piano wire in public display which really frightened Hitler into coming up with his own plan for his own demise should it come to that. Hitler wasn't surprised and had already sent reinforcements southward. In an operation he ironically called Operation Axis, German troops quickly disarmed Italian troops in the north. The Allies continued fighting the Germans up through Italy, but then winter set in, meaning mud, and everything slowed to a halt. All right, said the Americans, let's do it our way as well. Germany had made itself a lot of enemies, and millions of Allied troops had been gathering in England as factories worked around the clock producing the war material needed for a super crazy massive the likes of which the world has never seen before invasion of Europe. The Germans knew an Allied invasion would come, but they didn't know where it would land. Thanks to Allied deception tactics, they thought there was a pretty good chance it would come at Calais, but the Allies were really going to land in Normandy. Because and the whole point of Calais, as you can see here by the, the map, was it was the shortest distance between uh, Britain and France. In fact, Calais or Calais, was uh, occupied by Britain. Not occupied. It was owned by England, rather, for quite a long time throughout the medieval period and into the uh, bit of the Renaissance. Because it was less fortified and the beaches were nicer. Under the careful planning of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the invasion that had been long in the making was just about ready to go. Just one thing was preventing the launch, the British weather. For a short while, everyone sat around waiting for a decent day. And then... It came. On the night of June 5th, over a thousand bombers took off and raided coastline defenses, while paratroopers were dropped inland in a bit of a chaotic operation, tasked with sabotaging defenses and capturing key bridges to stop any German reinforcements from reaching the beaches. Early the next morning, the barrage came, as Allied ships fired a huge number So if you ha haven't been to Normandy, but if you ever get the chance to visit Normandy, uh, it's, it's quite an experience. Um, I'm originally from Utah, and uh, when I visited... Uh, or was it exactly? I visited all over Normandy, but I visited Utah Beach and uh, Saint Marie du Mont or something like that. I think it was the village. I uh, just happened to speak to a, a French couple in a store, and they could clearly tell that I was an American. And they asked me where I was from, and I said I'm from Utah. And they looked around puzzled, like, "We're in Utah." And I guess they, they didn't know that uh, Utah Beach was named for a, an American state, so that was kind of amusing. But uh, Normandy really has embraced its World War II history. Um, but if you're in Normandy, definitely stop in at Bayeux, because you can see the Bayeux Tapestry, and that is a fantastic piece of history that is nearly a century old at this point. So... Normandy is a really super cool place to visit. Oh, another pl cool place to visit in Normandy is um, a small village. It's not so much a village anymore. It's more of a church with a couple houses around it. Uh, but this church was set up as an aid station by two American paratroopers during the battle. And they treated Americans and Germans alike. And you can see, see bloodstains on the pews and other battle damage left over from the war. It's a really, really neat piece of history that you can visit and, and get a sense of what it was like on June 6th and the chaotic battle that was going on. And also the bravery of these two American paratroopers. Number of shells at the German fortifications, and then the landings. The Americans at Utah and Omaha, the British at Golden Sword, and the Canadians at Juneau. It was a tremendous struggle with a great loss of life. 
particularly at Omaha, but the Allied troops captured the beaches and the landings were a success. Then they began their movements inland. They took the port of Cherbourg and the city of Caen. The Americans moved south to capture Brittany. Then, in a massive disaster for the Germans, British and Canadian troops from the north and Americans from the south trapped the German 7th Army in a near wipeout encircling movement. In August, Allied troops landed in the south of France to little resistance. On one beach, all they found was a Frenchman handing out champagne. Paris was liberated. Excuse me. I don't know if that's true. Um, it's possible, I guess, but I, I would think that the Germans would be a little more careful about defending southern France. I, I don't know. I don't know about that part of the European campaign so much. And the Germans were pushed out of France as the Allies entered Belgium. In the Far East, the Allies started to push the Japanese out of Burma as the Americans launched a two-pronged offensive in the Pacific. In the south, General MacArthur led the push to liberate the Philippines, while General Nimitz oversaw the brutal island-hopping campaign. American forces had to make hard-fought landing after hard-fought landing on fiercely defended small islands as they moved steadily towards the Japanese mainland. The Japanese believed that the greatest thing a person could do was to die in battle, and the most dishonorable act was to surrender. As a result, there's a few... <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a few... Uh, great books, I would say, that uh, one ought to read about the war in the Pacific. My personal favorite is With the Old Breed on Peleliu and Okinawa by Eugene Sledge. And uh, his experience were dramatized in the HBO miniseries The Pacific. The other one is Robert Leckie's Helmet for My Pillow. Um, I would say Leckie's is a little more raw, um, but sledges is more tasteful in that you get a good sense of of what it was like to be there without discussions of terrible gore and things like that uh from sledge uh i really learned that the battleground was just absolutely it was a garbage dump in some cases because you were dug in in foxholes and you couldn't leave those foxholes because you would be you would come under fire and so you had your rations tins that you just chuck out of the foxholes you had tins that that were filled with human feces and things like that so battle was just not as clean as i think a lot of people think about it you know in, in films and stuff you don't really see that you see destroyed vehicles and uh some kind of metal trash around but you just don't see the other trash that happens in battle they fought ferociously to the very end and the closer the americans got to the mainland the more ferocious the resistance became in february 1945 the americans captured the island of iwo jima and an intense firebombing campaign of japan's wooden cities began the Allies suffered some setbacks trying to liberate the Netherlands, but they were making progress and were now threatening the industrial heartland of Germany. Hitler's health, both mentally and physically, was rapidly deteriorating. Things were looking bad, and he was desperate. He said, we need... Yeah, I, th I think it's always a little bit dangerous to psychologically diagnose anybody from the future. ...to turn this thing around, and I have just the trick. Remember a few years back when we blitzkrieged through the Ardennes and trapped the Allied forces in Belgium? Well, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Again. He gathered his forces and tried to pound them through the Ardennes. He used up the remainder of Germany's strength and resources, and he managed to create quite a nice bulge. He also trapped some American forces in the Belgian town of Baston. The Germans sent the trapped Americans a message saying, surrender or be annihilated. Oh, yeah, like, when it was read out to the, the commanding classic officer, story. he said, they want to surrender? No, sir, they want us to surrender. Nuts! And that's what they sent off as their official reply. General Patton's Third Army then managed to break the siege from the southwest. And the Germans Airborne were and the Band back. of Brothers Hitler's story. Hitler's last ditch attempt had failed, and what followed was a total collapse of the German forces. The Allies pushed into Germany from both sides. The Soviet Union took Warsaw and kept pushing to Berlin. In his bunker, Hitler realized all hope was lost. Berlin fell, and with it, Hitler's dreams of a great German empire. Two of the Axis nations had been knocked out one to go. The Americans began their assault on Okinawa, the last island before they would reach the Japanese mainland. The desperate Japanese fought hard, launching kamikaze attacks on the U.S. ships. The citizens of Okinawa suffered through the terrible fighting, but in two months, the, the fighting on Okinawa was absolutely horrific. Um, the civilian population wasn't spared, and in fact, in some places, uh, sort of these lower islands of Okinawa, <clears throat> the Japanese were afraid that the local citizenry would tip off the Americans and provide intel. So they forced the citizenry 
into the jungles uh, to live in the jungles and scrape out a living there somehow and a lot of people died in the jungle at the hands of the japanese military the island was captured the allies now had to make a choice either continue the devastating struggle up the Japanese mainland, or they could try to coerce the Japanese into surrendering now. In July, the first successful atomic bomb test took place in New Mexico, and the destructive weapon was ready for use. America and the UK were also seeing the Soviet Union not so much liberating as occupying its captured territories. So at this point, the, the, the idea that the Soviet Union would simply occupy the territories and not, you know, give them their freedom, that wasn't confirmed. Um, as far as I know, it was su uh, suspected, but it wasn't confirmed. Um, also, they don't appear to mention it here. President Roosevelt died in April 1945, and his vice president, Harry S. Truman, became president. And so they wanted to put on a show of force. On August 6th, the A-bomb fell on Hiroshima. Then, on the 9th, Nagasaki. Hold on, sorry, I may have missed an important part. Back up is gauche. August 6th, the A-bomb fell on Hiroshima. Go further. UK were also seeing the Soviet Union not so much liberating as occupying its captured territories. And so they wanted to put on a show of force. On August 6th... Uh, but, uh, Stalin knew that the Americans had an atomic bomb. So President Truman wanted to impress the power that the Americans now held at the Potsdam Conference in July 1945 in Germany. And Stalin uh, feigned vague interest, but he already knew about it. So it wasn't, uh, it didn't have the effect that Truman hoped it, it would. Sixth, the A-bomb fell on Hiroshima. Also at this time, um, the Soviet Union and Japan weren't at war. Well, I mean, at this moment, yes, they were with the atomic bomb, but when Germany fell, uh, the Soviet Union hadn't declared war on Japan. Then, on the 9th, Nagasaki. The cities were reduced to rubble, and for the people living there, it was a terrible fate. But for the Allies, it achieved their main aim. In September, the Emperor announced Japan's surrender, saying the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. After six years, war was finally over. So I think the decision to drop the atomic bomb will always be a controversial historical topic and argument. And President Truman was the man who made the decision. And he himself, uh, almost 20 years after the war, uh, made some public addresses as to why he decided to drop the bomb. And I think it's easy for us to be a Monday quarterback and judge the past. But if you were an American at this time, whether you were an American soldier, nurse, uh, mother, father, brother, son, anybody, you wanted the war to come to an end. You were tired of war at this time, and if there was an opportunity to end the war quickly, it was an option that should be taken. It should be taken advantage of and done. So I don't think the decision to drop the bomb was all that controversial at the time. Um, it only became controversial later after people could comfortably sit back from the future and evaluate all of the facts from all sides and, and make those judgments. The Allies occupied Japan for eight years. The Emperor was allowed to keep his position, but General MacArthur made sure this picture was printed in the Japanese press. So it's interesting that, well, a lot of the American propaganda throughout World War II was total war and total surrender. You know, we're going to get Hitler, we're going to get Mussolini, and we're going to get Hirohito. And of the three, Hirohito was the only one who was able to, to keep his power and basically survive. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, is because Japan and Germany didn't really work that close together. They didn't really coordinate in the war. And so because of that, uh, I think the Allies understood that there's there's really two separate wars going on here, even though they're legally connected by a treaty, they're not coordinating enough to where they're culpable for each other's war crimes. To display to the Japanese people that their emperor was not the divine powerful being they had believed, Germany was divided between America, the UK, France, and the Soviet Union. In 1949, the Allied sectors were united into West Germany. The Second World War had been more terrible and destructive than the first.
In its aftermath, two major superpowers with two very different ideologies had come out victorious, and the tension between the two of them. I just want to pause on this map because you know, we see Switzerland here. It's just hanging out by itself. It's it's neutrality. Um, Switzerland prepared itself for the war, and and did play a role in the war. Even today, if you drive uh, in northern Switzerland, like through the cantons of Schaffhausen and Argau, you can see in the forest the remains of concrete bunkers that were constructed to defend against the Germans who were just across the Rhine River. There were also instances of mistaken, mostly mistaken, I would say, uh, bombings of uh, Swiss cities and towns. So like Schaffhausen itself, for example, was bombed by Allied bombers. And because Schaffhausen is really just across the Rhine from Germany, it's a more or less understandable mistake. But yeah, just the bombing of Switzerland by Allied bombers, it uh, created some interesting diplomatic moments between Switzerland and the Allies. Them ...would create a new kind of war. A very, very cold one. Wow. Okay. So it looks like that's the end of this video. But uh, if you stuck with me to this point, I really, really appreciate it. And I think that Oversimplified has gotten better in how they're telling these stories uh, in the few that I've seen so far. And I hope that I've been able to provide a little more information uh, about World War II. And I encourage you to go ahead and, and read books for yourself and think about the arguments that the book authors make and come up with your own conclusions. And I would say even talk about them and discuss them uh, with other interested people. And so I will leave it there for the day and hope to catch you in the next video. Thank you. Churchill. That